All right, if you got your Bible, turn to the book of Acts for uh, one final time. Uh, hopefully not ever, right? Hope, hopefully you do return to the book of Acts at some point in your Bible reading. But in terms of our sermon series, this will be uh, the last sermon in our series in the book of Acts, which we have been in for many months now. And uh, I hate to see it end. There's been so many things the Lord has uh, taught me, and I trust you as well as we've studied this book. I had of many meetings this past week, uh, two of my meetings uh, really talked about how the, the book of Acts has impacted them. Uh, one gentleman I had lunch with going through a vocational change uh, talked about how like studying all the detours in Paul's life, how he thought he was going left and the Lord took him right and, and he had to kind of learn that, you know what, my life is being guided by someone else, not my own calendar. We've talked a lot about that in the book of Acts, and he just said, you know, as I'm going through this, this career change, this job change, like that's encouraged me that God is simply moving my mission. Another gentleman I, I, I had coffee with this week just said, as I thought about all the trials that Paul went through and, and the sufferings and the, the storms that he went through, he just said, I literally Sunday morning just lost it. And just wept as I thought about, you know what? If God was sovereign in Paul's storms, he's sovereign in mine as well. And, and so those are just a couple examples of how I hope the book of Acts has encouraged you uh, to think about how all of your life is mission, that every single area is to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Whether it's a detour, whether it's a storm, whether it's persecution that you're facing, all of life is mission. All of life is mission for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? So let's look at this last passage here in Acts chapter 28 as we're going to pick up reading in verse 17. If you're able to do so, able to stand, please do so as we read God's Word. Acts chapter 28 and verse 17. Acts 28, 17 says, After three days he called together the local leaders of the Jews, and when they had gathered, he said to them, Brothers, Though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. And when they had examined me, they wished to set me at liberty because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, though I had no charge to bring against my own nation." For this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak with you, since it's because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing this chain. And they said to him, We've received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here as reporters spoken any evil about you, but we desire to hear from you what your views are, for with regard to this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him in his lodging in the great in greater numbers, and from morning till evening he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, go to this people and say, you will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear. And their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. And he lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. This is God's Word. Pray with me. Lord, thank You for what You've taught us over these last several months in this book of Acts. Thank You for the gift of Your grace in giving it to us. Thank You that You, through Luke, detailed the, the very mission that You began 
upon your resurrection. And so you've given us the opportunity to study these things and to be inspired by uh, these men and women who gave their life to this mission. And so Lord, I pray that tonight you would speak to us again. And Holy Spirit, you know exactly what we need to hear. And so uh, even if it's not what comes out of my mouth, you take what is said and you speak to your people and draw us all to the cross and to the foot of Jesus, we pray. In Christ's name, God's people said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. On January the 30th, 1965, over 3,500 people representing 112 different countries were all gathered together at the historic St. Paul's Cathedral in London. And there, they would be a part of one of the most elaborate, one of the most decorated ceremonies of any statesman in history. On that occasion, it was the funeral of Winston Churchill. And it was quite the spectacular event. The the queen was in attendance that day. There was a a 19-gun salute, a, a flyover of 16 fighter jets. And then after the funeral, they took Churchill's coffin and they escorted it through the streets of London to Waterloo Station. It was an historic moment. But what was remembered most about Churchill's funeral was not all of the dignitaries that were in attendance that day or the military salutes that took place or the, all the elaborate activities. It was how Churchill chose to end His funeral. See, Churchill had actually planned in detail his own funeral, and the way he wanted it to end was at the the closing prayer he had instructed a, a bugler to be positioned high in the dome of the cathedral, and upon the very last amen of that last prayer, the bugler would play this. It's the universal signal that the day is over. The sun is set. And the the sadness and the silence in the cathedral at that moment was so thick you could feel it. But the silence was soon interrupted by a second sound. You see, to the surprise of everyone in the cathedral, Churchill had actually instructed a second bugler to be positioned on the other side of the cathedral dome. And upon the playing of taps, the second bugler was to play this. It's the universal signal that a new day has dawned. It it, it was as if Churchill from the grave was saying, it's time to arise. It's time to get up. It's time to move forward. A new day has dawned. Oh, no doubt it was a very strange ending to a funeral. But but you see, Churchill wanted everybody to understand that this wasn't the final chapter. This wasn't the end. It's actually just the beginning. And every single one of us 
has experienced that kind of thing in one way or another. That is the idea that sometimes the ending of something, albeit strange or hard or painful, is actually the beginning of something else. Some of you have gone through this, the the ending of a job. Uh, The gentleman I had lunch with this week that was very hard and painful to go through, but is the beginning of a new opportunity. Or maybe it was the ending of a relationship that was extremely painful for you, but it was the the beginning of a a new chance. Or or maybe for you, it was moving to a new city, to a new neighborhood, and, and it was really hard for you to leave the old place behind, but it was the beginning of a new day. All of us, in one way or another, has experienced how the ending of something is actually the beginning of something else, the start of something new. That, dear friends, is exactly how the book of Acts ends. In fact, Acts chapter 28, if you read the commentaries, and I I, I encourage you to do so, it actually perplexes scholars. They they don't know really what to do with how Acts 28 ends because it's it's a rather strange ending. Look, Look at verse 30. And Paul lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance, the end. There's no grand finale. There's no like fireworks that go off. There's no climactic ending. In fact, the reader who's been really engaged in the story is actually left with more questions than they have answers. Uh, 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 What's the final verdict for Paul as he stands before Caesar? Does he actually survive? Uh, Does he escape in the middle of the night in a basket like he did in Damascus? I just thought that picture was cool, and so I wanted just to show it to you, right? (laughs) Uh, Does he actually make it to Spain where he ultimately wants to go? And In other words, uh, kind of in the cinema world, it's a cliffhanger. Like you're left not knowing, for some of you uh, older people, who shot J.R. (laughs) Now don't acknowledge if you know that reference or we will know how old you are. Or maybe some of you not as old. Does Ross and Rachel actually get married? Or some of you younger generation, every episode of Stranger Things. See, nobody laughs at that one because most of you are old, all right? So, or, or, or my cliffhanger, like, uh, does John Dutton actually die that way? Any Yellowstone fans? You sinners. Anyways, like, like you're just left, like, how does this end and how does it turn out? And, and, and how, what are the details? And that's how Acts ends. And you're left with all these unanswered questions. It's a strange ending unless you've been following the story. Because if you've been following the story, you realize this isn't a strange ending at all. It's actually the perfect way to end the book of Acts. Look at it again in verse 23. When they had appointed a day for him, that is Paul, they came to Paul at his lodging in greater numbers And from morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus from the law of Moses and from the prophets. Again, in verse 30, he lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. In other words, the story ends like this. The gospel continues to be proclaimed. Anybody in here, anybody here tonight know someone that just won't shut up? Don't point. Okay, some of you are like, you! You know what I'm talking about, like the politician, that it's always the same talking points, or the parents, it's always the same lecture, or the guy with the really bad pickup line he uses all the time, like, I'm like Dairy Queen, I treat you right, or, you know, something really stupid like that and lame, but, you know, just somebody that just won't shut up. They don't know when to shut their mouth. Faith family, listen to me, listen to me. If the book of Acts teaches us anything... It's that the early Christians, and particularly the Apostle Paul, simply cannot and will not stop talking about Jesus. They simply cannot and they will not stop talking about 
Jesus. And so we should see this as, of course, this is how the book of Acts would end, that the gospel, as it's been throughout, is continuing to be proclaimed. Jesus is continuing to be spoken about everywhere believers go. Think about, for instance, Paul's commitment to being a witness for the Lord Jesus. The conditions to which he was a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul faced external threats. He was a witness in the face of government leaders, political and religious leaders. Paul was a witness in the face of internal threats, false professions, relational conflict in the church. Paul was a witness in the face of spiritual attacks as he dealt with sorcerers, demonic spirits, uh, and also a false teaching, physical attacks. He was a witness in the face of mobs and in prison cells and in stonings. Paul was a witness when he faced natural disasters. Last week, we talked about how he was a witness for Christ even in the midst of a storm and even in shipwrecks. And did I mention snakes, right? I had to bring that one back up. Like everywhere Paul is and everywhere he goes in season and out of season, whether it is winter or summer does not matter, Paul can't shut up about Jesus. Everywhere he goes, he takes this being a witness for Christ Seriously, and so in Acts 28, when he's under house arrest and brought before the Jewish leaders in verse 17, what does he do? It shouldn't surprise you. He proclaims Jesus. In any condition, he was a witness. Think secondly, the characteristics of his witness. Uh, You see a few examples here in Acts 28. For instance, Paul witnessed in an honorable way. He wasn't a jerk for Jesus. You do realize you can be a witness in such a way that turns people off to Jesus. The gospel is a, a, an offense in and of itself. We don't need to be the offense. Amen? And Paul proclaimed Christ and was a witness in an honorable way. In fact, this won't be on the screen, but in verse 19 he says, But because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appear to Caesar, though I had no charge to bring against my own nation. Listen, I'm not trying to cause problems. I'm not trying to create controversy. Uh, I don't have anything against my own nation. I just have to tell you about Jesus. And in the best, most honorable way I can, I'm trying to be faithful to Christ. It really made me think about uh, Luther uh, to take a little uh, journey down church history. You know, Luther, for those of you that are Catholics, Luther or were Catholics, I don't know if you're here and still Catholic, but anyways, (laughs) I'll try to convert you afterwards anyways, or maybe during. Um, But Luther, when he set out, we're talking about the Protestant Reformation, Luther actually wasn't trying to cause some uh, reformation. He just simply couldn't be silent about the fact that one is justified by faith alone, not the sacraments. We are justified and made right before God because of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's that righteousness is accounted to us that makes us right with God. And so he was trying as best as he could to do it in an honorable way, but he simply couldn't stop talking about the gospel. Paul's the same way here, not just in an honorable way, but he did it biblically. In verse 23, everything that he's saying about Jesus, he's saying based on the law of Moses and the prophets. He's trying to show them based on the Scriptures who Jesus is. And then lastly, we see in Acts 28, he's a witness boldly. Look at verse 31. Again, it won't be on the screen. Proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. And so the, the, um, the conditions in which Paul is a witness, the characteristics of his witness, and then lastly, the content. See if you can pick up on what the content of Paul's witness was. Look at verse 23. We just read these a moment ago, but notice the highlighted parts. When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in greater numbers, and from morning until evening, he expounded to them testifying, say this part with me, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus. Now look at verse 31. You say the yellow part. Proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, Paul's content 
was pretty simple. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. It's all about Christ. And it's all about the kingdom that Christ has brought with him. We are called to be a witness of a person. Amen? Not a church, not a denomination, but a risen Savior. And so in every condition Paul was in, in an honorable, biblical, yet bold way, he couldn't stop talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you expect the book of Acts to end any other way? Oh, that this would represent our witness as a faith family. Amen? In whatever season we go through, in an honorable, biblical, and bold way, we would have one message and one message alone. Jesus saves. Not how to have a better life. Not how to make your dog more behaved. But that Jesus saves. Jesus saves. And the reason why we should see this as the appropriate and perfect ending to the book of Acts is because how does the book of Acts start? Look at Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. This is what Jesus said to the disciples. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my what? Witnesses. In other words, from the very beginning, Jesus said this whole thing, wherever it goes, is going to be about being a witness of the gospel, a witness of mine. That was the beginning, that was the end, and it was everything in between. Peter preaches in Pentecost in Acts 2. Acts 4, Peter and John proclaim Christ to the council. Acts 7, Stephen is a witness to the point that it cost him his life. Acts 8, Philip shares with the Ethiopian eunuch. Acts 10, Peter shares Christ with Cornelius. Acts 13 and 14, Paul and Barnabas are sent out all over the place to proclaim Christ. Acts 27, Paul bears witness to God in the middle of a storm. Acts 28, Paul is before the Jewish leaders in Rome sharing Jesus. And I didn't even cover all of it. In other words, the whole book has been about this. We are to be witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice this on the screen, faith family. A privatized faith in a resurrection, resurrected king is biblically inconceivable. A privatized faith in the resurrected king is biblically inconceivable. I believe in the one that walked out of the grave, but I'm not going to tell anybody. That is insane. That's insane. If you believe, if I believe, if we faith family believe that Jesus is alive and he is the one that conquered death and the grave, how in the world can we not witness to that? Oh, a privatized faith is insane to the book of Acts and the rest of Scripture. Notice this on the screen as well, faith family. People that believe in the gospel with conviction will proclaim the gospel with confidence. If we are convicted of this, we will be confident to declare it. Faith family, we believe that Jesus died and rose again. I'm going to rewind because you missed your moment, but that's okay. That's okay. I love you anyways. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And based on Romans 10, here's what I believe, and here's what I believe that you believe, that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. I believe that. I believe that if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and if you believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. But if we believe those things, we must also believe the rest of Romans 10. For how will they believe unless they hear? And how will they hear if they're not told? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word. Of Christ. Have you, faith family, thought about over these last few months your witness? That is, you're testifying to who Jesus is. Let me give you just a few practical things. 
a few practical things as we close this book. His first is live differently. And what I mean by live differently is that Paul's life was constantly provoking questions. The one example of this would be last week, his response in the midst of the storm, when he didn't respond to the storm the way everybody else responded to the storm. And there was something about that that made people ask questions. Uh, it reminds us of 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Notice this here, right? 1 Peter 3.15, But in your hearts, honor Christ as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that's in you, yet do it honorably. Do it with gentleness and respect. Don't be a jerk for Jesus. But live in such a way that people ask you, why are you different? Why, why, why do you give differently? Why do you respond differently? And in such a way, you have an opportunity to be a what? A witness. Number two. Think missionally. Think missionally. It's the example I gave you earlier about the man I had lunch with this week who is now viewing his vocation change or his job change as a part of the mission. Start thinking missionally that all of your life is mission. Your work is mission. Family's mission. Church is mission. All of life is mission. Uh, Luther was asked um, by a cobbler, uh, that is, what shall I do? That is somebody that makes shoes. And he says, make the best shoe you can and sell it for a fair price. That is, see the way you work and the people to whom you work with and the people to whom you get to serve all as mission. That it isn't about your life, it's about your opportunity to testify to someone else's life, namely the Lord Jesus. Number three, pray evangelistically. Maybe out of this series you would just start praying daily for someone that you know that doesn't know Christ. Maybe you would ask others to join you in praying for that. Uh, one thing almost anybody is open to is prayer. And so just start praying for someone daily that you know doesn't know the Lord. Number four, I have to mention this one, is give sacrificially. You know I don't actually preach a lot about giving. Uh, and, and the reason is, is because I want you to be motivated to give based on the gospel, not based on a sermon. There's another good amen right there, okay, but that's okay. That's why I, I'll preach on giving when the text demands it. But listen, I, I, I want us to see that giving is a part of the mission. It's interesting that non-Christians give about 2% to charity. Christians give about 2.4% to the church, which means Jesus makes a 0.4 difference. And, and again, I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty, but here's what I'm saying. If we've learned anything in the book of Acts, these men and women gave everything to the sake of the mission. They were sacrificially selling their homes to see how they could keep the mission advancing. I'm not suggesting that's your application unless the Lord just leads, but I am saying that we should pray evangelistically, but we should also give sacrificially and be devoted with all of our lives to this mission. And then lastly, I would just say share faithfully. Share faithfully. God is giving you opportunities all the time to be a witness. Uh, you've heard this expression. You've probably heard me bash it before, but I'm going to bash it again. Uh, you've heard the statement, preach Jesus, and if necessary, use words. You heard that? Nonsense! That is, that is unbelievably unbiblical. And, and listen, I get the idea that's behind it. The idea that's behind it is I'm, to, I'm just going to live in such a kind way that uh, people will know the gospel just through my being a really good person. Listen, notice this on the screen. Showing kindness without sharing Christ won't save anyone. Showing kindness without ever sharing Christ won't save anyone. The fear is they may just become a believer in you. And that isn't the mission. The mission is that they would become a believer in Jesus, and that takes words. That takes sharing a person, the person of Jesus Christ, with other people. And so share faithfully. There's all different kinds of ways that we can continue to proclaim the gospel in the way we see it in the book of Acts. Amen. So it's a perfect ending to the book of Acts that the gospel is continuing to be proclaimed. But that's not the only way the book of Acts ends perfectly here in Acts 28. Look at verse 24. In verse 24, And some were convinced by what he said, and others disbelieved, 
And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement and the Holy Spirit uh, was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet. And then he goes on to quote Isaiah about how uh, the people would be hardened and their, their ears would be closed to what the prophet would bring to them. And so, but, but notice back verse 24 again. I want you to, to emphasize this. And some were convinced by what he said. So the second thing we see is not just the gospels continuing to be proclaimed, but the other way the book of Acts ends is the kingdom continues to be advanced. In Acts 28, by this point, we have been the Johnny Cash song, I've been everywhere, man. Okay, this is just a picture of the Apostle Paul's missionary journeys. Like, you thought your life was busy. Hello. Like, this was this man's life. Look at where he went. Look at all the places he took the gospel to. And there weren't airplanes. I went to seminary for that, okay? Like, he had to do all this by ship and who knows what. Like This is where this man went his entire life. And in every single stop along the way, guess what keeps advancing? The kingdom of God. Oh sure, there were many people in those places that wouldn't believe, that refused to believe, but there were thousands upon thousands upon thousands of men and women and families we see throughout the book of Acts that repented and turned to Christ and were saved. See, the gospel was proclaimed and the kingdom advanced in different ethnic groups, whether it was Jew or Gentile, in different cities, Jerusalem, Samaria, Athens, Corinth, Macedonia, uh, Ephesus, different economic classes, Lydia, who was rich, the jailer, who was blue collar, uh, the slave girl that was poor, different settings like the synagogues and riverbanks and homes and the Ethiopian man living in a van down by the river, right? I mean, it just literally is in every corner of the world. And now the kingdom, Acts 28, comes to Rome. Does that strike anybody that Acts 28 would come to Rome? That Paul would end up in Rome? How did this mission start? It started when God sent his son into the world and a Roman authority by the name of Herod wanted this baby dead. And 33 years later, that baby who had now become a man would be crucified and killed by Roman authorities. And in Acts 28, the gospel of this man would make it to Rome. Here's my point, faith family. Look at it on the screen. You can't kill the mission of the man who walked out of the grave. You can't kill the mission of the man who walked out of the grave. Rome has tried everything it knows how to do to shut this man and mission down, and yet the gospel still makes it to Rome. It, it kind of reminds me of something that Jesus said, kind of like the gates of hell will not prevail the building of the church. And if the gates of hell won't prevail, Rome, you ain't got a chance either. And neither does America or China or Thailand or any nation in this world. For there will be disciples of all nations. As we see the beautiful picture in the book of Revelation, there are going to be men and women and people from every tribe and every tongue and every nation who will bow to the feet of the Lamb. When the gospel is proclaimed, the kingdom advances, and we shouldn't be surprised that this would be the ending of the book of Acts. Why? Because how did it begin? Acts chapter 1, verse 8, again, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. 
Don't you see this is exactly how Acts should end? Because it's exactly what Jesus said at the beginning, that this gospel is going to go everywhere and the kingdom of God is going to go with it. And it is what we have seen, Acts 2.41, that those who received the word were baptized and added 3,000 souls. Acts chapter 4, verse 4, many heard and believed, and the number of the men was 5,000. Acts chapter 5.14, more and more believers were added to the Lord. Multitudes of both men and women, Acts 6, 7, the word of God continued to increase and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. Acts 9.31, the church in Judea and Galilee and Samaria was being built up. Acts 11.21, and a great number number of those who believe turn to the Lord, Acts 28, and some were convinced by what Paul said. Don't you, don't you see? I mean, maybe you can't see it with your eyes, but it's happening. This kingdom is advancing. This kingdom is building. It is going everywhere to everyone. In other words, what Acts is showing us, notice this on the screen, is when the gospel is proclaimed, the kingdom is advanced. When the gospel is proclaimed, the kingdom is advanced. And that doesn't mean it's not going to meet resistance, that it won't be without resistance. It's why Paul quotes Isaiah 6, uh, that you're going to be sharing this to hardened people, which means some will believe and some will not. Have we not also seen that in the book of Acts? And this is meant to encourage you, faith family. Because some of you will get really discouraged as you seek to be a witness for Jesus and some will say, I don't want anything to do with that. I, I, don't, I don't want to believe. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to trust in this Jesus. Don't be discouraged about that. It will remind you, Acts 14.4, look at it. But the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. Acts chapter 17, verse 32. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. But others said, we will hear you again about this. And so Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed. Acts chapter 19, verse 8. He entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief. In other words, Acts has been clear. As your witnesses... Some will believe and some won't. Some will reject this. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting Jesus. And some will walk away. But notice this on the screen. It's not our responsibility to know. It's our responsibility to sow. Like this is one thing we as Americans have a really difficult time, and certainly it's the case in church growth, is we're so consumed with numbers. Aren't we? How much is your church growing? How many, I mean, I, I was, uh, I won't mention the denomination because I'm not trying to pick on them, but uh, um, when I was in Thailand, me and my missionary friend were sitting in the uh, uh, hotel lobby and there was a leader from a particular denomination who was there. And uh, he came up to us and he said, we've just got this, this dream that like in the next 10 years, we want to see a billion people in Asia one to faith in Jesus. Now listen, listen, don't be ye of little faith to me, okay? Uh, there's nothing impossible with God, amen? But a billion, like I've been to Asia a lot and I know how difficult it is and how hardened it is, Isaiah 6. Like, why are you so consumed with a billion people? Why does it have to be a number? How about just preach Jesus and let the number depend upon Him? But that's how we think as Americans. Oh, you got to set a goal and you got to have a number. Last time I checked, when you start the book of Acts, the apostles didn't say, hey, by the time we get to Acts 28, it's going to be a billion people. Okay? We might even bring some people from Minnesota in, even though Minnesota doesn't even exist yet. And I'm saying the sarcasm, I'm laying it on pretty thick. And, and listen, I, I'm not saying that numbers are evil. I'm just saying this. It's not our responsibility to know. It's just our responsibility to sow. We get so discouraged and consumed with what the response is going to be that we forget that the response isn't up to us. Our responsibility is just to not be quiet. 
about Jesus in an honorable, biblical, yet bold way. You with me? So just get the numbers out of your mind and, and stop being concerned about, and by this, I'm not saying don't be concerned that they respond. I'm just saying learn from the book of Acts. Some are going to believe and some won't. And the responsibility to bring the increase in the harvest is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one that will build his church and there is not a single thing that you and I, powers or principalities, the U.S. government or the gates of hell will be able to do to stop it. So just proclaim Jesus and he will build his church. One final thing we see here and why this is the perfect ending of the book of Acts. Look again at verse 30 and 31. And he lived there two whole years at his own expense, at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. You see finally here the mission moving forward. It's just the end. Again, why end the book this way? What, what about Caesar and, and how does Paul die? You, you want to say like, there's got to be more. You, you get to the end of Acts 28 and this is the question you're asking. Where's Acts 29? Where's the rest of this story? How, how does this all end? And here's why this is the beautiful, God-inspired, perfect way to end this book, and it's this. Notice it on the screen, Faith Family. We are Acts 29. We are Acts 29. The reason why the story doesn't finish is because the story isn't finished. That would be the huge mistake in the book of Acts is to think, why didn't this have a better conclusion? Because you might actually think the mission has concluded. But it ends open-ended because it ain't done. Because the mission's still moving forward. Because we must understand that the same Father that sent the Son into the world to bring salvation is our Father. That the Jesus that sent the disciples out to make more disciples is our Jesus. That the Holy Spirit that gave them power in Acts 2 is our Holy Spirit. That the gospel the apostles proclaimed everywhere and turned the world upside down is our gospel. These Christians that live daily on mission are just like us. Faith family, the book of Acts is not somebody else's story. It's our story. The book of Acts is not about the first century. It's about the 21st century. It's not about Athens and Corinth and Rome. It's about Burnsville and Lakeville and Apple Valley and Rosemount and the rest of the South Metro in Minnesota. And it's not names like Paul and Stephen and Barnabas anymore. It's our names written in Acts 29. The redemptive story of God's mission to all peoples continues to this day. And if you think that being on mission stops... When we stop studying the book of Acts, then my friend, we have failed to understand the book of Acts. Because it ends this way to show us the mission isn't finished and your life is Acts 29. And I know it doesn't feel like it because you can't turn to a chapter and read your name. And then Neil went to Lakeville on a... <laughs> donkey and was persecuted by a mob and you don't read that in there be weird if you did right but every day you get up to go to work and every night you have that nighttime prayer with your child it's acts 29 it's acts 29 because the mission's still going. It's still unfolding. We're still living it today. And so we leave the book of Acts, but we don't leave the mission. If anything, we are more compelled to be witnesses for Jesus than have ever before. 
because of what God has spoken to us about in the book of Acts. Amen? So faith family, I close this series. I close this evening by taking you back to a gathering. But it isn't a gathering that took place at St. Paul's Cathedral. It's actually a gathering that took place on a mountain in Galilee. Hundreds of dignitaries from around the world weren't in attendance. It was just a small group of fishermen that would turn this world upside down. And these were men and women who faith family just a few days earlier thought this mission was over. And the reason why they thought the mission was over is because they had watched the funeral of their leader. Silence and the sadness in their life was so thick you could feel it. Faith family, they were terrified because they thought everything they'd just given their life to was over. <laughs> but Jesus' death proved to be anything but the end. No, faith family, it was just the beginning. The mission's not over. The mission isn't complete. Arise. Get up. And move forward. Because as we proclaim the gospel, Jesus will build his church. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Pray with me. Pray with me. Lord, thank you for your beautiful, inspired ending to the book of Acts. It is exactly how it should end. Because we are left seeing the gospel proclaimed and the kingdom advance and this mission moving forward. And it's still happening today in every part of the South Metro. It looks like going to work and it looks like raising children and it looks like having a conversation at a coffee shop. It looks like all of those things, but what it actually is, is your kingdom advancing in the world. Your church being built. And there is nothing anyone can do to stop it. And the unbelievable, like inconceivable gift of grace is we're called daily into that mission. We get to be a part of what you're doing in the world. So give us individually and give us here as a faith family a God-sized vision 
for this mission. Transform us as a result of looking at the book of Acts these many months to really think about how all of life is mission. Thank you for what you've done in these many weeks together as we've been able to study this as a faith family. Thank you for the life transformation and the testimonies that have come as a result. And Lord, we know that you will continue to do that as we study other things, but the mission will not stop. You can't kill the mission of the one who walked out of the grave. So we, to our last breath, will continue to declare that Jesus is Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.